Hey, this is MJ from the Coaches Panel. I hope you're well. The buys are done, and for Supercoach, it comes to the interesting part of your 2024 Supercoach season, where for many of us, after the moves we make this week, we start heading into some luxurious trading spaces. We're definitely getting to the low spots of players that really are starting to be like, man, I might not have enough trades to move you out of my team and really hoping to get on the guys that are storming home for the back end of 2024. We're going to talk about all these things and more on your Supercoach solo strategy roundtable. Yep, another me and you hanging out together talking all things Supercoach. Couldn't assemble a few members of the panel, but that's all right. We still want to talk through a bunch of different stuff for you this week. In a few moments, I want to share with you my best for the rest, who I think are going to be top of the line in every single line for the remaining component of your super coach season. There's some really important players, some unique pockets that I think we could change our mindsets on a little bit, maybe start to see them as the viable top end targets for us for this whole of the season that's coming, as well as a couple of unique guys. And of course, there will be no shocks on a couple of them. But with the final trades of upgrades that we're making now i know a large portion of the community are boost out and they're down to only two trades a week and politely after this week could be as low as a handful of trades if not less after this week and it's something that we spoke about on the podcast last week with pig mentality and i'm i'm keen to pick it up again this week as a little bit of a conversational piece and give you both sides of the perspective. It's one of the things we want to do here at the Supercoach and have for the almost decade we've been around is give you all the pieces of information you need to be able to make an informed decision for yourself uh, to help you play the game in the best way possible for you. And the dilemma that coaches have for themselves this week is this. Do I put all my cash slash points on field or do I try to deepen my bench with a 23rd or even 24th premium option? And so what I'm alluding to is the fact is, are you just, you know what? I want to get as strong I can on field. And so that extra 200,000 I have sitting in the kitty, am I putting it on top of my worst performer on field to be able to maximize my scoring either by getting into who you believe is the top prospect in that line that you don't own, who's got a nice fixture coming up, who's had an injury that's created an opportunity, whatever the narrative and pathway is why you're doing that. That's the idea of getting the best of the best is sacrificing some of your bench scoring depth to be able to maximize on-field points as opposed to the other mindset, which is, I'm going to build squad depth. And the reason for doing that is kind of twofold. One, it saves you having to make a trade if a premium is out injured for more than a week. And with trade scarcity starting to hit our super coach teams, there's some validity to that. The other is it enables you to be a little bit more fixture uh, reliant where there's certain teams that are favorable to score against, certain teams that are restrictive depending on how the stars and planets align a little bit for you, it, you then have that opportunity. So, so let's talk about the two mindsets uh, and then how that kind of works. To do a 23rd premium is playing a cautious approach. Uh, that's not a bad thing, by the way. Um, cautious approach of coaching isn't always a bad thing, but Certainly recent history would say that coaches that have done well in Supercoach have lent themselves on more of the aggressive nature. And so by building a, a 23rd or even a 24th premium, and I use that term loosely, by the way, um, but a 23rd, 24th option that's not a rookie or a cash cow, um, by doing that, you're playing it conservative. You're banking on the necessity and need to be able to bring that in rather than maximizing points on field, where you instead of looking at potentially splitting your M8 and going up to getting someone who you think could be top of their line, one of the best, an example might be a Josh Dunkley or an Adam Trelaw off of a Clayton Oliver, for example, and putting that money that is on your bench uh, through a downgrade and an upgrade, one up, one down, and or money you've already got sitting in the kitty that you're wanting to allocate on someone. It's the difference between putting that onto Clary up to 
a Dunkley, a Neil, a Trelaw, whoever it is that you don't have that you want to own, as opposed to splitting that a little bit and taking the money on a Reville or a McAuliffe or a Clark that might still be sitting at your M8, M9, M10s, putting it up there so that you're trading into a Connor Rosie type. Look, both have strengths, both have weaknesses. For me, um, the big leading indicator that would give me confidence around how to approach it would be simply this for you. How many trades have you got left? And what's your risk appetite? And then the third thing would be what are you ultimately aiming to achieve? Uh, If it's league or rankings focus, it's totally different things, totally different mindsets because all you're trying to do is get yourself in the chance to have a double chance in finals for leagues and not worry too much about as much about the timings, the fixtures, the break-evens, although they're important. You're just trying to qualify in high as you can. And your trade cadence is to some degree linked to the matchups that you have to some degree. Whereas rankings, it's now all about these final sort of eight weeks and the moves that you can make. I think both philosophies work, uh, but both have an element of risk. When you put all your money on the field, the risk component is when or if injuries or suspensions come, you're then either forced to put a lower prospect on field using a reveal, for example, a dowling on field to cover for that week, or you're forcing yourself into a trade to keep up with the scoring that you had. That's the risk. The reward is you're getting who should be better scoring prospects and making up those 10 points per game, 15 points per match, whatever it is you're trying to do between who's currently there and what you want to be there. That's the ideology and mindset is anything you might lose for the week of a cash cow covering, you're going to make up over the six or seven weeks and save that kind of depth trade to maximize the hope ceiling and scoring. So, so that's what the mindset is there. The other with going for a little bit more depth is simply a little bit of trade conservative nature, because you know, over somewhere over these next six to eight weeks, guys are going to get put out to pasture that might be carrying some injuries with teams starting to no longer qualify for finals and or teams that have already secured finals and they're just trying to get players cherry ripe. They might take some conservative approaches and by building some squad depth, you build that simple ability to save the trade uh, that might normally be needed and push them uh, with that depth cover. So, So both have, honestly... Both have merit, both have risk, but that's why I come back to those kind of three criteria leaders for you. And I want to ask you, what is those three criteria leaders for you? The first is how many trades have you got left and how many more moves do you need to make to get to a team that you feel content that have premium potential performers? Um, Then they might not be priced at that, a Simpkin, for example, but there's enough potential for him to be in that space. So he's someone that is there. So it's all about how many trades have you got? Um, That's the element. How many players are linked to that? Do you need to get to, to a quote unquote completed team? What's your risk appetite? Some coaches that play super coach love to take the game on and are happy to, you know, get rich or die trying while others are steady and slowly build their team and hope that these other teams kind of, you know, you, you hope to become the Stephen Bradbury of Supercoach in one regards where they fall over with no squad depth, no trades left. Now they're just putting guys that are, I don't know, your 30s and 40s and 50s, if not copping donuts and you're getting 90s and 100s and you're making up those points feverishly. So so that's the element that you're looking for. Um, And then it always does come down to what's your focus? Is it rankings or leagues? Both of those things determine and dictate a lot of what you're doing and why you should do it. But if you are looking for a 23rd premium, I want to propose three options for you. Honestly, there's a bunch of them, but I want to propose three that could be on field. And and if they are, that's perfectly fine. But I think, you know, more idealistic sensibilities, who would be those three players that I would say, look, if you could get them in your rotation of a DPP position, 
that could be absolutely huge. Um, one is a defender mid, one is a mid forward, and one is a pure mid. And the reason I've given you a pure mid is because hopefully you should have at least one mid forward in your forward or in your fo- of course, you've got one in forward line in your midfield. That even if it's a dead rookie, you should be able to flick it through. So even if it's a Kyan and Brown, uh, Billy Dowling, he's he's not a dead rook, but you know what I mean. Someone that's not going on field, you can move the Heenies, the Zorkos, the Flanders, the whoever's around. Um, but I want to give you a couple of options so that you've got that versatility to go through there. And hopefully you've got an element of DPP links so that if you are looking for a 23rd premium, you're able to move players around multiple positions through there. So the first one I've got for you is Jai Simpkin. I think there's a world where you can go 90 plus from here on in for the rest of the season. And Probably the only reason he doesn't is should injury occur. I feel like North Melbourne have landed in a really nice spot from him. And while he's not a completely heavy, saturated center bounce midfielder, it does feel like North Melbourne has found a really nice midfield mix. So at just over 400K, coming off the back of two tons now, as you can see on screen, if you're watching on YouTube, is he does look and appear to me that he's got that sort of 50-50 split, Wardlaw, LDU and Phillips seem to be the core three with Phillips, the tagger, and then guys like Simpkin and, and a little bit of Powell um, and a little bit of Sheasel getting opportunities. It feels like they've got that mix pretty right. Certainly their p- past two weeks is the best they've looked and Simpkin scored well, albeit against teams that midfielders in Supercoach with Melbourne and West Coast are a little bit more favorable, but North Melbourne do have according to DFS Australia, for inside mids, probably the best fixture from now to the end of the season, specifically in the last month. So to to me, there may be a world where Simkin ends up on field at F5 or F6 for you, but I think in the more idealistic sense, you've got who I think are the top six forwards from now to the end of the year, and he's able to cover you through a couple of link spots. So to me, I think if you could get Simkin in there, that would be one. The pure mid that I want to suggest to you is Connor Rosie. Just over 400,000. Unbelievable scorer on his day. He he is more suited to the other formats because there's not as much contested components to his game. But that said, what he lacks at contested ball winning, he makes up for in disposal efficiency, in scoreboard impacts, um, and and some other key key scoring criteria for super coach. And so why is he at 400,000? Well, simply uh, there are three injury impacted games for Connor Rosie this season two hamstring and basically the same injury, but two separate games. The other against North Melbourne a couple of weeks back um, suffers a a little bit of an ankle roll and hurts himself pretty decently in the first quarter and basically is parked forward for the rest of the, of the game. What we saw last week is a little bit closer to who he truly is, but don't forget after the first five weeks of this season, what was he averaging? 116.6, and you're getting him at just over 400K. This is where he works as the perfect M9 swingman to those that own a Clayton Oliver, for example. And now you've got the ability to check matchups, the position of who plays when over a particular weekend, and you give yourself that opportunity to at least loop all those scores, let alone should you get any form of injuries or anything like that. So to me, I think if you're looking for any midfielder that could become your M9 that could sneak on field eventually. I'd put Connor Rosie into that mix. And then the defensive line, it's Colby McKercher. At time of recording, uh, it's not been announced whether he's coming back to play from this week, but he played really well in the VFL last week. And I think they're going to give him every opportunity to shine for the final few months of the season, just over 375,000, just under 380, if I'm being honest, but his three round average uh, before injury was a 109. So should he maintain that or regain that, core distribution role off half back, which I think would make a lot of sense given they feels like to me and looks like to me, they've got pretty settled with that midfield core. He just slides back beautifully into a distribution space with Zach Fisher and at under 400 K with DPP, 
If he can go 90 from here on in, that does protect you for. Um, if you're taking some risks with some maybe potentially injury-prone style of players, more in legacy rather than recency, um, he just gives you that option. Um, so to me, I, I think McKercher sits in that space. So those would be the three. A mid-forward, I think, could be Simpkin. A pure mid is Rosie. And then the defender mid, should he be named this week? Um, he's got a negative break even too from memory. So I, I quite like Colby McKercher. So if I was looking for a 23rd premium, these would be the guys I'm looking for. I suppose you could say if you're looking to get someone cheap, they sit in that space too. But to me, um, those would be the ones that I would suggest to you. So I've alluded to it a little bit at the top of this podcast, but I want to give you my thoughts on who I think is going to be the best scoring prospects for the rest of 2024. Um, who's going to be a, a defender, mid, ruck, forward? There's going to be some names that I don't think are going to surprise you. And then there might be one or two that just sneak under the radar a little bit. Uh, in the defense, let me tell you who I've got, and then you can argue with me in the comments below if you'd like to. And let me walk you through the names. Luke Ryan, Nick Dacos, Harry Sheasel, Jack Sinclair, Bailey Dale, and Elliot Yo. Yes, those are the ones. Some notable omissions. Uh, Dan Houston was close. Uh, Lockie Whitfield was close. Uh, James Sicily was close. But to me, these are the ones. I know there's no Pierce in that Fremantle back line for at least the next three to five weeks, depending on the media reports. But to me, uh, he's such a reliable scorer, even when he does play a level of accountable football. If, if you go back about three or four weeks on the Supercoach Strategy Roundtable, it's the episode uh, that we did with Jaden. And he did a beautiful breakdown of helping us understand the Supercoach scoring, where and how it is weighted. He did a fantastic job of that. And even if, and the reason I link that back to Luke Ryan is everything about how he plays and how Fremantle want and push him to play is beautifully weighted for Supercoach. So over the next few months of the year, could he be as scoring as high as he has for the previous sort of 12, 15 weeks of the year? Look, he doesn't have to, but to me, he's still a top six defender for the rest of the year. Nick Dacos, do I really need to explain why he's gone in there? He's been a gun for so long. I think it's going to maintain. Harry Sheasel's in that same space too. He's shown now that even in a more midfield prominent role, his skills, his scoreboard impact, his ability to win contest, and his ability to still maintain high disposal efficiency while winning stronger, higher contested rate. It's not damaging his scoring like some of us had feared that he had. I'm happy to put him in the mix. Pig Mentality's talked about from the Dr. Supercoach team a little bit about just how good uh, the run home is for Jack Sinclair and the Saints. And for me, I'm a big believer in getting into Sinclair if I can. And then the final two, because I don't think any of those four surprised too many people, um, is Bailey Dale and Elliot Yo. Elliot Yo is your very typical high risk, high reward. I think if Yo plays the next eight weeks of the year, he'll average 120. He is so important to this West Coast team. His ability to just sit beautifully in the scoring pockets of Supercoach, make him a perfect fit for me. While Bailey Dale alongside Yo both have really good fixtures uh, for the remaining few months of the season. So while they might not be on paper who you think are the best, and you might put a Dan Houston, for example, in front, who's got a good couple of weeks coming up and then a couple of tougher weeks, I think both these guys, where they're at their favorable best, sit in a good space for me. So to me, those would be the six that I'd ideally like to have, um, whether or not it's worth trading out one of those almost guys like a, a Sicily or a Houston or a Whitfield. I don't think for some of them it's worth jumping up to. Um, but to me, if I could pick who I think are the top six scoring defenders from now to the end of the super coach season, those would be the ones. In the midfield, there's a couple that I've got in there. And again, some no real shocks. I think it would be uniform agreed that Bont sits in the pocket. Um, although he's injured apparently from training this week, but you know, the last time he heard himself at training, he went and got a 170 or something, wasn't it? So happy days. Maybe we're on, on track for another one. So I'll put him in there. Zach Butters. Um, the tag concerns me a little bit. I, I, I won't deny that. But if I was a Zach Butters truther and a Zach Butters owner, 
I'd still hold and keep the faith. I still think he's going to go 120 over this back portion of the season. So I'm happy to back him in and that scoring and uh, to take him there as well. Caleb Sarong is another who's shown a little bit of basement more than we probably would have liked over the past sort of six weeks. We've not seen the high 150s like we'd kind of become accustomed to over the first couple of months. But to me, I've still got Sarong super high on the list. And then the other that probably is hard to argue against is a Zach Merritt. Um, Essendon have some nice matchups, including still this week. I think it's still a a pretty favorable matchup. Yes, he's the tag target for teams every single week, but his ability to find the ball, not just through contested moments, but just through elite endurance running, he finds a way to link up across all three components of the ground. And so to me, I I think you probably to feel like you're going to be pushing for success in the back portion of this season, you would want at least three, if not all four of those guys. I still think they're going 115 to 125, those four across them for the remaining part of the season. The next four, well, this is where it might start to get a little bit different for others. But to me, I've got Luke Davies Uniac right in the mix. I spoke about just moments ago. I think North Melbourne on paper have the best matchup for mids uh, that we could ask for, for center bounce and, and clearance and inside balls. And Luke Davies Uniac is right in the sweet space of delivering that. So he's not the one you probably um, might think sits in that space, but to me, I'm really quite comfortable that LDU will drive at home. This would be the third season in a row that he storms home, pretty much averaging around that 120 marker, if not fractionally more, given how good he is at the back end of the season, that it feels like North Melbourne's sitting in the, in the pocket of how this midfield should function. And on paper, the fixtures look beautiful for inside mids. So for me, I'm happy to put LDU inside my top eight mids from now to the end of the year. His past month, he's been doing it. I think that's going to maintain for us. Uh, Then the other three I've got is a Lions pair, Lockie Neal and Josh Dunkley. Uh, Both uh, on their day can go 160, 170 with relative ease. Neal is certainly the more tag risk than what Dunkley ever is. Um, but if Neil's not tagged, man, a 150's on the cards every single week. While Dunkley just does everything right. When he drifts forward, he takes marks and kicks goals. He does win contested ball. When he does have the ball, he's generally a pretty good user of it. And then that defensive work rate he does um, is elite. And so you know there's going to be more, you know, maybe even up to a dozen, but anywhere starting from a handful of tackles per game, Generally, one or two of them will lend themselves uh, to holding the ball decisions and off he goes. And all of a sudden to me, I just don't see a world where Josh Dunkley doesn't go 115 over the back portion of the season. And then the last one for me, he's probably the most informed midfielder in Supercoach at the moment. It would be a brave person to go against Errol Goulden, and I'm not that brave to be able to do that. So he sits in my top eight mids from now to the end of the season. He's been the perfect trade-in option since the buy. He's absolutely been killing it for coaches. Tags will come, absolutely. But I think the beauty of Errol, it's a little bit similar um, to what we know about Zach Merritt. Um, is he just runs all day. He's got high time on ground. He's got a beautiful mix of inside and outside. Uh, He doesn't miss targets all that often. He does and is one of the key drivers of inside 50s for the Swans. And if you think the Swans are going to fly home like anything near the way they've started the year, then that's going to be the case. I don't see them getting too cute with him uh, and worrying about managing game minutes for finals. Rather, I think it's going to be some others in their team that play a little bit more on the inside that if they were to manage them, they might look to be players like a Taylor Adams, for example, that are on the older scale, um, have got a little bit of an injury history that should be concerning to you, whereas Errol, he's only a handful of seasons into the AFL career. He's arguably just started his run home to potentially push for another deep Brownlow run. So to me, I I think Sydney would be really hesitant to move off him and and barring any kind of injury uh, minimization. For me, he's in that mix. Then the rucks, let's talk about them. Won't need to spend a lot of time there. I just got the best two rucks of the season. Uh, I'm going to put them in there. Max Gorn, 
Brody Grundy. Uh, there's no reason to go against Gorn. And Grundy is on fire at the moment, absolutely dominating and seems to be getting better and better as the season goes on. Look, I don't think it'll be a drastic jump from Grundy compared to what a, a Marshall or an English might be able to do for us. But to me, Grundy has got a phenomenal run. We talked about this last week on the strategy uh, episode. You can go and check that one out from uh, myself and Pig Mentality from Dr. Supercoach. Like it, it's just beautiful run that Grundy's got. And I, I think there's a world where he outperforms Max over this next two months. Uh, he's the only one I think that could. And that's why I've got him in at the top two spot and why a Marshall or an English haven't got there. And then to wrap up the podcast, um, who do I think are the best six forwards? Look, three aren't going to take a lot of guessing, and probably four if you're honest. But Zorko, Heaney, Flanders, I think any team that's got a level of success to this point has had all three for a good portion of time, and it would be a brave coach to jump off any of them. I think injury is the only reason you're considering moving out of any of them. They're far and above the best three forwards for us this season. And while we have been a little concerned over the year and preseason, we didn't have great top-end forward prospects. I'm actually not too scared by what the forward line has dished us up this year. We've still got enough good top-end talent. We're just maybe as blessed as we were in 2023. So those are the top three options of my six. The other three, before I get there, there are some notable omissions. Uh, you could put a Dylan Moore in there. Uh, you could put a Brian Myers in there. And you could put a Harry Mackay in there. And you could put a Jai Caldwell in there. All of those guys, I think, could sit in the top six. And if I had any of them, Look, I probably wouldn't trade out of them uh, unless I didn't have one of those three forwards that I mentioned earlier in Flanders, Heaney, Zorko. I think they're going to be close enough, but I still don't have them as my top six scoring options from now to the end of round 24. And that's the whole purpose of the exercise. So who are my three? Uh, Isaac Rankin. Uh, he's deserving of his space there now that he's moving up higher up the ground and with the crows pushing all the language that they are trying to build some form of confidence back into the team as they push forward to 2025 because finals is out of the equation for them he's absolutely the key for that he is the best player on this team by a long long way and that's not to say anyone's bad on that team gosh Dawson was an All-Australian a little over, under 12 months ago. It's just that's how good Rankin is. To me, I've got him going 105 from now to the end of the season with him spending so much time through the midfield but not losing his ability to impact the game inside forward 50. I just see him, especially with a couple of favourable matchups for the Crows, potentially dishing up a couple of really nice 130s, 140s, while the basement game should be around that 85-90. Just given he's going to impact the game at centre bounce, he's going to do some really freakish things and score inside 50 and have multiple opportunities. So for me, he sits in that space. Uh, the next I've got is a Charlie Kerno. He's got a really nice run, as do Carlton, uh, for key position forwards over the next few months. He's done well to score around that 90 pocket for us over the last sort of six to eight weeks, given it had been a tougher matchups for key position forwards, but it's starting to open up now for him. And if he's getting four or five goals per game, my goodness me, not only is he sewing up another Coleman medal for a third in a row, but he's going to go 95 to 105 from now to the end of the season. So to me, I'm really comfortable with that. I don't see him dipping his scoring much below 80. And the reason for it is how super coach scoring is weighted. He does things at important moments of the game that are actually very, very favorable for us. When he's forward of the ball, he takes contested marks. He kicks goals. Um, and he kicks them at critical times for the team and critical times of the game, which is important. And then the other thing he does well is in the final few minutes of a quarter, um, outside of if they're winning, and even then, sometimes they do it in the last quarter, is he goes back and he takes intercept marks. Sometimes they're even contested at moments as well and sets his team up with that. So when he goes back and takes those, another scoring plus for us in Supercoach. So to me, I think Kerno is going to be in that space for us. And then the last one, maybe it's controversial, especially after a disappointing one for us last week, but it's Luke Jackson. Ruck forward, so 
provides cover, which is a factor for sure. But to me, I think he's got 95 plus written all over him. And then all it takes is one or two weeks of no Sean Darcy. And he'll pop that 110 sort of scores really, really easily, let alone if he's impacting the scoreboard with some favorable ruck matchups. Because we we do see that a little bit from Longmuir, is he does tend to play certain rucks, whether it's he or Darcy, give them a little bit more time based on their opponent. So to me, I can see Jackson pretty safely going 95 from now to the end of the season. 100 average, I think, is more likely. And it could be a little bit more depending on the amount of games Sean Darcy misses, if any. So to me, that would be my top six forward. Heaney, Flanders, Zorko, Rankin, Kerno, and then Luke Jackson. But who's in your best for the rest of the season. I'd love to know if you're watching this on YouTube, you can comment below, not only with your trade plans for this week, but also I'd love to know who you've got as the best scoring prospects from this coming round to the end of the year. The past doesn't matter. It's all about the future. I'd love to know who you have picked and why. If you are watching this on YouTube and you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, make sure you do so. If you're listening to the audio podcast, leave a five-star rating and subscribe. And you can, of course, join our Patreon supporter group. They get access to a bunch of other great content year round and we'd love for you to join our Patreon supporter group. It's one of the small ways you can show a little bit of gratitude and thanks for the content you got from the coaches panel. Really since December we've been dropping content for you really regularly almost daily throughout the preseason. So if you loved what you've got from us and encourage you to become a Patreon, all the details are in the description of this episode. We're back to best 22 on field. I couldn't be happier about it. I've hated the buys this year. Um, Just not a lot of fun with that much best 18. I'm hoping for less of that in 2025. I like the challenge of a 22 on field and not getting bailed out and protecting poor scores. I love the challenge that it brings having that. So we'll see what opening round it brings for us next year. But look, good luck this week. I hope the trades you make absolutely fly. I hope your vice captains see moves that you make, crush it so you're not stuck worrying about who to put the captaincy on on a Saturday afternoon or on a Sunday. And from all of us here at the Coaches Panel, we wish you well. and We'll chat to you soon. Good luck heading into this week of your Supercoach season.